Hi, it's Mark Owen from Moose Monk PR, the editor of Punchline Magazine, and welcome to Punchline Talks, the business breakfast briefest, where each week I invite a panel of business experts to review the morning's newspapers, find out what's going on in their own individual business and their own individual business sectors, and finally, what's caught their eye in this week's Punchline. So let me introduce you to the panel. We've got John Workman, his senior partner at BPE Solicitors, Nick Stafford, the associate director of Hazelwoods, Cecily uh, Elliott Berry, co founder and director of Siblings Distillery, and Talitha Nelson, CEO of Gloucestershire Community Foundation. Thanks ever so much for joining us today. I'm going to have a quick look at the newspapers, so I'll just share them over there. Let's just go through the headlines courtesy of the uh, BBC. Bank rates rise of head of spiraling inflation, says the uh, says the Times. The Daily Telegraph, Hunt set to launch capital gains raid. The I, Britain faces longest ever recession in toxic shock. The Financial Times, Bank of England takes a dovish stance despite biggest rate rise for 30 years. And the story that's caught my eye in the bottom there is this one. Small business owners risk higher bills as Hunt considers a, a tax hit on dividends. The Metro, this will hurt, says Hunt. The Daily Express, stormy times ahead. UK faces longest recession. The Guardian, failed at every stage. Uh, the anger at the arena bomb response. The Mirror, Staffy fought, but she was let down. Terribly, terribly sad story. The Daily Mail, what on earth has happened to our 999 services? The Sun. HMS WAG set sales. Do we really care? No. And the Daily Star, rise of the Gimposters. <laughs> Don't you just love the Daily Star? You know, when I was jogging and learning the uh, doing the London Marathon, I ran past one of my neighbours, and I swear, this is no joke, half past five in the morning, they were closing the curtains, and the guy was wearing a gimp suit. All I could, <laughs> say, all I could say was, he just had a zip. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, with that, I've got... Never know what goes on behind closed doors. <laughs> Never know what goes on behind closed curtains. Right, anyway, <laughs> John, let's start with you, sir. What have you picked out of the papers, please? Well, um, yeah, I, I, uh, the, the one that you, met, you you already mentioned slightly is the um, the raid on capital gains tax um, that uh, it, it is, it's been he heavily, no pun intended, telegraphed. What, it, what with it being in the telegraph? Um, and that's... Um, the suggestion that CGC will go up to income tax rates, presumably uh, some of the, uh, the, the, the breaks for entrepreneurs will go. Um, and as you've all, all, already said, uh, dividend rates, uh, dividends will be taxed at higher rates, et cetera, et cetera. So um, obviously there's going to be uh, an outcry about that and it's an impact uh, on entrepreneurial businesses in particular who take, uh, take risks to get capital gains rather than income and pay themselves out of dividends. So query, is that going to, uh, actually be counterproductive in terms of hindering growth, uh, which we appear to be somewhat short of. And um, do you think, John, so do you think that they're actually the Tories going to hit their base? Because you know, a lot of small business owners <laughs> used to vote Tory. Yeah, well, a lot of people used to vote Tory, I think. But um, I think the, well, 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 you've got to hit somebody. You know, um, and I don't buy that the whole of the budget black hole has got to do with Liz Truss. So you, you, um, uh, pathetic though it was, it's not. It hasn't caused all of this, but um, there is a hole. Um, I personally, and I hate to say this, I mean, I, I would would rather pay a bit more tax and have better services. But um, yeah, is it going to hit growth? Um, there's an interesting point um, about small businesses and entrepreneurs, and it's have we got too many of them? Oh. Interesting question. Because if those people actually worked with other people, collaborated, shared resource ideas. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they'd be easier to fund these support. Um, how many small businesses do we really, really need? I mean, there's billions of them. Um, yeah, one man and his, his dog is a small business. Well, what's that doing for the economy? What if they work with other people and created uh, a, a bigger business, creating more jobs? So I'm, um, I'm kind of agnostic about that. I think there are too many people who think they can run a business and can't. Well, we all know lots of people, I don't know, we all know lots of people who can't run businesses that do. I often think, oh my goodness, you can't even explain your business. How, yeah. how the hell can you market it? But so uh, they, hi there, good morning, Silly. Lovely to see you. You've got your mic off now. Hello, <laughs> we'll get there in the end. We've had a few techie problems this morning, but it's lovely for you to, to join us. Thanks ever so much for joining Punchline Talks. We're just working our way around the newspapers at the moment. Uh, let's go over to you, the Talitha. What have we picked out from the papers, please? Thanks, John. 
Well, it's all doom and gloom out there. So we've got to find the golden nuggets. And I have to say, Martin Lewis is a shining light amongst all this, trying to give us hope. But he's actually given us a stark warning as 40 percent of over 400 pound energy vouchers go unclaimed. Um, essentially, the government is obviously giving us some of these rebates. There's 25 million sat there unclaimed. Um, it's whether people know how to claim it, know it's there. Um, so I think if you do a simple Google and, and educate yourselves about how to get hold of this money, it's going to be absolutely vital for people. So we can't allow monies just to sit around because otherwise they end up disappearing off to some government pocket somewhere and going into something else. Um, but yes, so it's a really important piece around claiming every bit of money you can, because actually the reality is you have to earn over £45,000 as a couple to actually pay your bills. So there is ordinary two working people in families that literally cannot afford to feed their children. So this is incredibly important. Things like this don't go unused. OK, what else have you picked up, Talitha? Well, actually, um, the Spanish minister urges Sunak to commit to climate crisis fight. I'm slightly embarrassed about this government not committing to their own manifesto. Um, and I think sort of trying to dodge cop it, as the fact we're supposed to be <laughs> the, the hosts um, is a bit embarrassing. I just think it's all a bit embarrassing. Um, you know, we all know, I mean, it's saying that Europe alone has, has risen in... Um, in temperature dramatically about, oh, I can't, um, just scrolling through what the percentages are, but essentially, you know, we can't deny that the climate, there's things going on and we need to start working on it now and that we need to get behind it. And then sort of saying that Prince Charles shouldn't be going along. Well, it's all got a bit embarrassing. And I think, you know, the rest of the leaders um, are urging uh, us to get our houses in order and stop flapping about and start showing some leadership. So. I think the climate change and COP is incredibly important. We have to have these conversations and we must start making pledges, but not just pledge, actually get on and do something. I'm, I'm actually surprised you're only slightly embarrassed about our government. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm completely embarrassed. Well, I'm apolitical, remember. I'm not I know you are. I know you are. And I can't I'm be really political I'm in my role. I'm completely embarrassed about our government. <laughs> I talk to my friends overseas. It's just, just shameful. Anyway, right. Nick, what have you picked out from the papers, please, sir? Well, hi, good morning. Yes, um, this morning I uh, picked up The Guardian and um, the article that I picked out, it kind of follows on from a couple of the comments we've had. But it, as you can see, it's actually uh, quite a small section uh, of, of the paper, but it's all to do with um, uh, the proposals uh, that the PM's looking over to consider uh, extending and increasing the uh, windfall tax on uh, oil and gas companies. And this is obviously in the wake of um, those businesses uh, having just had a very successful year, profits being far in excess of what they were originally forecast. And uh, the government uh, in, in the position of needing to balance its own books. So where can it go to do that? Uh, potentially go to those successful businesses that haven't necessarily suffered as much in the last uh, 12 months. And obviously the, the energy industry is one of those. But as the article really um, goes on to state, uh, the, 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 those businesses that have achieved those profits, their shareholders are putting pressures on them in the wake of these kind of murmurings of additional tax to um, take their monies elsewhere and invest it in other um, countries. And, and, and important things that it outlines is, you know, uh, they're looking at investment to secure Britain's um, energy security. And obviously we have a, an increasing energy need and uh, weighing it up as well with our uh, need to be, uh, think of the environment in our use of fossil fuels or not um it's it's a very difficult um uh line to tread and uh balance required on all the different uh aspects of it but um you know the the, the figures we're talking about the, the it's billions of pounds we're talking about recovering uh, up to 40 billion over the next five years so okay, so I, yeah I, lots to think about that. i'll tell you what nick let's go around the panel quickly everybody should we I'll start with you, Cecily. Cecily, sorry. Cecily, Cecily, Cecily. 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 Cecily, I'll start with you. Should we should we tax? Should they get the windfall tax? Yes or no? Yes. John, yes or no? Yes. 
Talitha, yes or no? Absolutely. We're the only country that have, has, doesn't seem to have done that when it, the whole of Europe has. Nick? They should. Um, they, they've already introduced something, but it doesn't appear to be working. So <laughs> I think they need to increase what they've done. I think they make so much money. They're just rolling and rolling it. They oh, got it absolutely. Their they got it on their beds and they're making money angels. Absolutely. That's what they're doing. Yeah. I mean, we're fifty percent renewables now. We could be a hundred percent. It's a quite simple model. I mean, um, I won't go into it, but you know, we're going to have to move on and move forward. And that that those windfall taxes should be going into making us completely independent on renewables. What I'm just really impressed that uh, Nick has bought the Guardian for two pound fifty. <laughs> I think he's frozen again. Anyway, let's yeah. go. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll move on to uh, Sicily. Very good. I've got, a I've got a problem. It's too early. Sissy, I'm very, very sorry. Okay, what have you picked out for the papers today, please? Uh, well, I've, I'm just fulfilling every stereotype you've had for Gen Z ever, so um, strap yourselves in. I, um, I haven't picked up any newspapers. I have, um, I subscribe to a couple of different online um, things, obviously, Punchline, um, but also some um, positive news uh websites and, and uh, outlets because I work with a lot of young people in our team and have made it my mission to bring some positive news <laughs> into the building every day. So um, one of the things I picked up which I thought was really really good was the um, new uh, packaging improvements that have been made by Tesco's. Uh, they've changed their whole bakery setup, they're going to be getting rid of 33 million pieces of hard plastic and unrecyclable plastic a year uh, and across their whole plan that's been just set out. They're looking to be saving around about 120 tonnes of plastic waste every year. Um, they've taken out of all of their own brand and all of their made on site products, huge amounts of plastic waste. You won't be getting bread covered in plastic and several layers of plastic and all those sorts of things anymore. Um, and that's also being seen with other companies like Deliveroo who are giving commission cuts to companies that agree to use only biodegradable packaging and minimise packaging. So some of the smaller businesses and takeaways that work with Deliveroo are getting um, good commission cuts from, from them to kind of incentivize them to use more eco-friendly packaging, which has got to be a good thing. I also read that there was a um, massive, massive uptake in cycling since pre-pandemic. And that was a, a study that was done in the last couple of months and just was released that cycling figures, so if you, for cycling at least once a week, um, figures are up 54% pre-pandemic. And in London, leisure cycling, so cycling on Saturdays and Sundays, is up 84%, which wow. I thought was pretty cool. And the government are now actually reconsidering their um, cycling strategy as being too um, unoptimistic and actually looking at changing their figures to be even more kind of extreme by 2024 because we're already hitting some of those targets um, based on kind of cycling around the UK, which I think is really cool. Um, and the last one, which is something that I found and have kind of been had an interest in for quite a long time is the use of psilocybin so i don't know how much anybody else knows about that but psilocybin is the active drug compound in magic mushrooms and there are currently around the world registered as being around about uh, 100 million people with major depression um so as you know have a risk of taking their own lives sometime soon and there was a study that was just released this week that was really, really positive. It found that the immediate effects uh, post taking a micro dose of psilocybin, so not enough to have the psychedelic effects of it, uh, to uh, 25 milligrams, 0.25 of a gram of psilocybin had immediate positive effects and that in post study interviews, the um, psychologists working with them would have said that they were in remission by their sort of a couple of days afterwards. And about a fifth of them still felt the positive effects of one dose 12 weeks later. Um, so huge, huge, hugely positive and much more positive than any sort of Western medicine has been recently. Um, and especially in the US, they're making sort of leaps forward in terms of legalizing microdosing of certain psychedelic drugs that are seeming to be hugely positive. And with the amount of young people and all people um, 
with depression currently around the world, which listening to the news is not totally surprising. Um, I think that that's really, really amazing. And considering that there's very, very few side effects, I think it could be something really positive moving forward. No, thank you very much. Thanks for picking out three very <coughs> positive stories there. <laughs> well, I'd never realised 84% increase in cycling in London. What I'd yeah. like to know is, is there an 84% increase in bells? Because <laughs> I don't know about you, but the amount of cyclists that don't have a bell Oh, uh, it's it quite now. John rides a bike. John, you do all your cycling. One of those, uh, you've got a speed bike, don't you, John? Good cycling. Have, have, Does it have a bell on, mate? Of course, it doesn't. <laughs> okay. It is very irritating when you're walking your dogs down a nice country lane and someone like a bullet comes past you. And I mean, you just thought, if I'd stepped aside slightly by a foot, I would have been taken down. <laughs> exactly. Um, so you, you fail to understand the, 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 the rules of the road, which is that cyclists are gods. And you, mere mortals are simply there uh, <laughs> to, to, to get out of the way, as are motorists. I mean, if you really want to get get it right about cyclists, how about the, the rules say, hey, why don't you cycle down the middle of the road? Um, because that's just suicide. <laughs> anyway, yeah, uh, the, the, if you really want to see fascism in action, go and, go and look at cyclists in Amsterdam. <laughs> well, no, thank you very much for that, John. I've got to go over to you, actually, then, mate. So uh, BPE, how is business there with you? And what's, I mean, you've been doing a lot of deals recently. You've seen... Yeah, this well, um, yeah, well, we, we do. I mean, we're, we're a deal doing firm. I mean, the, the last year's range from 3 million to 300 million in terms of deal size, which is, uh, um, in all fairness, 300 million is a bit of an outlier. But um, yeah, there's, 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 there has, we have been very busy on deals. I mean, I can't honestly believe we're going to be that busy for the next few months. I think people will be digest, digesting the, uh, uh, the economy. And I think for, uh, uh, deals in the retail sector will be, will be few and far between, certainly in terms of investment. Um, yeah, there's a lot, lot, a lot going on, which means you know people will sit on their hands for a bit. Um, sorry, the, the noise in the background is, is is the recycling people removing my brown bin. Um, but the um, yeah, there's, there's there's plenty going on. Um, but I can't honestly say that uh, you know people are hurtling and spend millions on things at the moment. Um, but I guess they'll then, they're, 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 as per usual, they'll start laying people off. So good for employment, ironically, uh, as in our employment team, um, there'll be litigation. Yeah, people will still uh, be, be be getting divorced. They'll still be dying, and uh, they'll still wanting occasionally to move house. So it's all right. Um, um, but uh, yeah, yeah, you can't honestly say that you expect the next twelve months to be a boom time. I, I read in the in the papers actually yesterday that uh, divorce rates have gone up by ten percent because of the fact of lockdown. Actually, couples have uh, have uh, finally had enough of each other, and um, you know, being. Yeah. Kept, uh, yeah. Well, I, th I, th I think, well, I think it, it, it may be truer to say that they couldn't get divorced during lockdown because, um, um, yeah, there, there was nowhere for them to move out to. Um, but yeah, so yeah, that, that's certainly a factor as well. But yeah, um, I, mean, I have to say, uh, yeah, um, um, our, 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 our family team, as we call it, um, obviously they don't need to divorce. There's many other aspects to it, but um, yeah, they are um, they are extremely well uh, equipped to deal with these things, and they're very very busy. Um, in fact, uh, one other, the leader of the team has been appointed a, um, a, um, a district judge uh, on a part-time basis. So that's uh, kind of good, good, good for her and good for us. I know no, your company just seems to be going from stretch to stretch. How many people are employed there now? Oh, I don't know. I can't count. Um, about 140, I suppose. 140. Not bad going at all. Thank you very much, John. Right. OK, let's go over to, to you, Talitha. We talked a lot in the past about the cost of living crisis. You and I went over to meet the imam the, the other day. And let's be honest, you work in the charity sector. Money is drying up. What, what's the feedback from your sector? It is uh, probably this crisis, definitely. We're seeing it's much worse than the pandemic. I think when we're in the pandemic, we're all in it together. Everyone had a, a, a level of suffering in some way, whether it was isolation, loneliness, not seeing family, friends. And so we all had an impetus to probably give something back. Volunteering, it was at the height since World War II. And, um, and donations were high because people had the emotional um, kind of impetus to, to really support. And then you hit a cost of living crisis and it really is only hurting a certain section of society. So if you're paying your bills, you're probably not likely to see um, the desperation on the ground. And I think what's happening, and, and there's two sides, donations have gone down. So for example, 
example, a food bank has got 4% donations coming in compared to 30% in 2019, but their need has gone up 55% in the last two months. So the crisis around the charity sector is, A, some of them have created contracts last year to deliver work this year and they can't afford to do it um, and they can't put their, their costs up. Um, the need is skyrocketing on lot on all levels from basic human needs up um, and the money's just not coming in. So there is, I guess, the first time probably in history we may be starting to lose some of our vital charities. I guess if you think of the social fabric of society and the protection we all have, you know, the NHS, the doctors, all the systems around us, the only reason they have they function the way they do, and I know they're under pressure, is because our charities pick up the pieces. If our charities close and our charities that do all this incredible work that most of us don't notice, we will feel it. We'll feel it on our pockets. We'll feel it on all of our services. Our NHS would probably crash. So our charities are absolutely vital and supporting them is vital, whether it's through donations and funding or whether it's through volunteering. So the CAB are taking two debt calls a minute, um, the distress of people trying to manage their money. Now they need about a hundred volunteers. So it's not just about money, um, but the volunteers are absolutely vital to help people that hopefully if they give them some debt advice and support, they may not end up at a food bank. So, you know, the whole system needs support in any way it can. So we've got a cost of living crisis appeal and we're raising money. We've got a hundred thousand pound target. We've raised 31,000 from very generous donors, uh, from businesses, individuals, um, and we need to keep going. We've opened the programme. We've already had £28,000 worth of requests, so we're going to run out of money pretty quickly, so we need to keep topping it up. Um, and that's going to across Gloucestershire um, to support this crisis. But it's hard to shine a light. There's a lot of doom and gloom. Such businesses are going to be getting stretched but if we really need if we can donate the rebate so the 400 pounds that we're all getting if you don't need it claim it but pass it on okay nice pitch and that leads very nicely over to nick actually because obviously he works in the insolvency department at hazelwoods are we seeing a rise are businesses feeling that pinch now nick yeah i think it's you know uh... We're all feeling it, individuals and and corporates. There's there's pressures on the businesses that um, only ratchet up over time at the moment. Um, you know, as as has already been um, mentioned, we 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 went through the pandemic. Uh, there was the ability to get through the pandemic for a lot of businesses uh, and individuals, but now we we've, we've come into the cost of living crisis, and that is that is uh, extra strain on businesses that were probably already under uh, a lot of financial pressures. Um, it's all the, the typical things that uh, we're, we're seeing. It's energy prices, cost of materials, uh, cost of staff, availability of staff. It's all typical uh, factors that are, that are coming in all to different cases. Um, and I guess the, the, the kind of the, the, the point uh, that's the key one is at what point do a lot of these businesses or individuals, you know, uh, come to breaking point? Because there was there was support offered throughout the pandemic, um, but but you know, there's there's not really anything there now uh, offering that kind of level of support. Obviously, there is with the energy, which has been mentioned with the vouchers, and I th I think the voucher thing is um, that's very much targeted at the. Um, uh, the, 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 the poorest in our society with their prepayment meters and, and it's whether is it actually is there an understanding gap that they need to claim those those kind of uh, those vouchers as soon as possible so so there's, there's, there's pressures on all of us um, the odd thing is that uh, when you look at the um, insolvency statistics um, certainly for corporate entities we're around about the level that we were at uh, back in 2019 um, you can't really compare to 2020 and 2021 um, because the, the, the government took steps to limit the amount of insolvencies over that period. Um, so we're certainly not at the stage where, you know, uh, compared to historic levels, it's incredibly high. Um, whether that's going to change and increase over the next six months, um, if you believe a lot of the news we, we, we get, then that may well be the case. We might start to see an increase in formal insolvencies. It's really a case, I think, of how long can people keep going feasibly uh, and with their business and business levels. Certainly, if more pressure is applied, we're going to see an increase in insolvencies, no doubt, I think. 
Well, I just I saw main.com that... have gone into receivership yesterday. I but... didn't expect that businesses like that. No, that's been sorry, who was that? Sorry. Made.com just went into receivership uh, yesterday. Yes, yes. I didn't expect that. Yeah, and that that's obviously a very big business. Um and, and that one is um that one I believe is PwC are going to be appointed administrators. So I think Mark, you you did an article earlier in the week, didn't you, about it? But yeah, um, we, yeah so so time. there will be businesses that yeah, that you know the, the expectation is that everything's perhaps going okay, but then, uh, you know, at short notice, the, the same the same old adage that almost every insolvency practitioner would tell you is, you know, try and take advice as early as possible, because um, if you take advice early, there might be options available to you. If it's done at too late a stage, the, unfortunately, the only option may be uh, to cease trading. And it goes back to Sicily's original story or uh, from the newspapers about the mushrooms and stuff, because it's all about mental health. If a business crash, if a business falls down, you know, that's your mental health, that's your family, that's your mortgage, that's everything can come cracking down around your ears. It's heartbreaking. You know, you build something up. Sicily, let's come over to you. Let's talk about Siblings um, Distillery. How long? Okay. You been, you're one of the founders of the company. How long has it been going now? <laughs> a very long time it feels like um it's been going for eight and a half years now um yeah we launched in june 2014 so oh yeah eight and a bit years because you you guys are it's all family business uh, and you're all quite young if i remember rightly i think i met you around five years ago at bbc radio Gloucester studio um so yeah how if you don't mind me asking how how old were you all when you started uh, I was 18, um, my uh, youngest brother was 15, and then uh, Clarice was 19 and Felix was 21. Wow, and do you all get on? Yeah, amazingly, <laughs> we do. Um, we are very lucky, we always, we know that we're very lucky because we do all, all get on. Our parents always run businesses together, so we had that kind of blueprint of understanding what is worth arguing about and what's not um, and if you want to get anything done in a family business you've got to realize that 90 percent of it's not worth arguing about and yeah we we're just i mean we even we go on holiday together uh, when we're not working so you know we're weirdos we appreciate that uh, but we, um, we just um we find that we work together really well as a team and you know it's in times like these when things are very very hard um for almost everyone um, having your family around you and working with your family and knowing that they're all on your side. Um, you know, I, I can't imagine what it would be like to work in a business where things were really tough and the rest of the team wasn't in your corner all the time. I think that would be, that seems, yeah, crazily tough. So we're and, lucky. And, and, and some of the good people leave. At least you guys are all in it together. You could have <laughs> what, and, so what, Yeah, there's how, no getting out. There's no getting out, no. So <laughs> Your company is siblings gin now how much do you produce a, a year how many people are you do you employ what, let's have still... volumes. What, what's the turnover let's start there oh gosh now you're asking do you know i um we're tiny we're still really tiny um in terms of people but in terms of output we've we've grown over the years so we're still a team of 10 in total um we have obviously all of our family um and then a a couple of kind of um, extra team members. We've got a sales manager. We've got a, a couple of guys who work on the production. We still do everything in house, so we don't we don't buy anything in. We we produce everything from start to finish on site, which is something that's really unique to our business in terms of distilling. Um, almost everyone around the UK that makes spirits uh, just handles a part of it. So whether that be the first bit of you know creating the base alcohol, the middle bit of refining it and creating the recipes, or the end bit branding it and, and sending it to market. There's very few companies that do all of that. And so we handle everything on site, which means that we can produce really, really high end, really luxury products. We produce for a lot of other companies now as well uh, as ourselves. So we have the output here um, in this distillery to um, produce around about 100,000 bottles a year. Wow. Um, we really work at different rates throughout the year because obviously for us, January, February are, are super quiet. Now at the moment, the run up to Christmas is, is really busy. Um, but yeah, we've we've taken on and kind of diversified, and that especially you know due to the, the lockdown, we we went into making mass ethanol for the local police, NHS trusts, care homes, and stopped making spirits altogether for a little while, and then went back into it as 
kind of things uh, the world woke back up again a little bit and um yeah we do do massively varied stuff nowadays we still do our farmers markets um but we also produce uh, a luxury line of spirits for dalesford organic um and people like the national trust and, and things like that so yeah really Really well, weird one business. Seriously, I think I'm going to have to do get get you back on, and we'll do a big interview with you if you don't mind. <laughs> a lot more. We don't have time to cover it all today. Um, thanks so much for that. Right, I'm going to go quickly back round and ask you all because we are running out of time. We are over time actually, but hey ho. John, let's start with you, please. What have you picked out from this week's punchline? Well, it's got to be Dobby's, hasn't it? Um, I mean, I don't know when. Um, garden centres became a sort of destination um, in their own right, but um, uh, I'm very keen to go to Dobby's today. I'm, I'm off today, so um, we're probably going to go see the new Dobby's. But we'll wander around and not buy anything. I never thought I'd hear you say that, John. I'm yeah. really keen. I'm really keen to go to the <laughs> new new Dobby's today. I've got you on recording saying that. I might I have a ringtone. Yeah. I finally joined the old age middle class. There you go. And I tell you what, it will blow you away. It is fantastic. I hate to say it as well. It's fantastic. Nick, what have you picked out this week's punch, please? Okay, so um, the the other than the Dobbies, um, exactly the same. I'm quite keen to go um, at some point. Um, was your ice rink story? So um, unfortunately, the story that the ice rink won't be making uh, its appearance in Cheltenham um, this year. But um, you know. Uh, small gleams of light it will be back in 2023 it's suggested and it appears that the increased cost pressures and procurement of the ice rink has caused um that to unfortunately not be possible this year um i suppose it's 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 a sad story because it was quite successful last year and there was proposed to be quite a long schedule for 2022 um, I, I didn't actually go to it um, last year. Uh, the one I, I went to, uh, we did have a trip with the kids down to the Quays. So small glint of light. There's there's one not too far away um, for, uh, you know, as an alternative. Um, but uh, I, I understand the one at the Quays actually is also on a reduced schedule from last year. So there might be a bit of competition for those um, those ice rink spaces. But it's a sad story, uh, but hopefully back for next year. I would imagine running an, uh, an ice rink Pretty energy intensive. Anyway, yes. uh, thanks so much. Talitha, what have you picked out? Um, I've picked out your good news story around the income that's coming to the Southwest. So it's the 200 million Southwest investment fund set for 2023. That's hugely encouraging for businesses. Um, the areas it's going to be supporting is Bristol, Cornwall, Isles of Scilly, Devon, Dorset, Gloucestershire, Somerset and Wiltshire. Uh, the... Um, British Business Bank is essentially looking for fund managers to distribute it, but it's going to be in three levels from loans to support. So I think that's incredibly encouraging for our business sector for the Southwest. 200 million um, is going to be hugely important to support our SMEs and small businesses. So that that's the story that really popped out for me. OK, thanks very much. Great positive story. Cicely, what, are, what have you picked out? I was very excited about Dobby's too, because <laughs> me and my husband absolutely love garden centres, so we're maybe old for our time, but we love a garden centres, so uh, we will um, definitely be taking a trip there, and that was very exciting. Um, and I also obviously picked up the, the same as Talika, the um, Small Business Fund, which, you know, we're opening a new business next year, um, yeah. our first bar um, in Gloucester. So, you know, th things like that, we'll be, we'll be talking to the Growth Hub and things and seeing if there's any opportunity for us to, to be involved with that too, with our, with our new business. But um, yeah, that's, it's always positive to hear that sort of thing. I did think it was a very large area <laughs> that it was covering. So, <laughs> you know. It's funny to say, I was thinking exactly the same. It's, it's, it's like all of, all of everywhere. Anyway, we've, yeah, kind exactly. of run, we've kind of run out of time. My top story today was Dobby's as well. Not because of the garden sensor, because it's the catalyst and the anchor store that will bring out the rest of the Cotswolds uh, outlet. And uh, just to let you all know as well, today there is a video going to be uh, that we'll put on the uh, website, which is actually a walk through with the chief executive of Dobby's, a uh, very nice chap called Graham, who actually walks me through the whole store so you can actually see it before you go as well. Anyway, thanks very, very much for joining Punchline Talks. I'd like to thank our fantastic sponsors, Hazelwoods Accountants and Business I Experts. Couldn't do the show without them. And thank you to my fantastic guests. Hopefully we'll see you all again next week. Bye. Cheers.